like we were talking about off camera is the majority of the things that I have to say um, or is somehow involved in an active project and so it's it's difficult to give the entire story in some cases um, you know I don't have stories that you have read a hundred times in God knows how many treasure magazines that that's not me I'm I'm not a I don't chase stories do you remember when I put out the treasures of Utah book mm -hmm. I had people bugging me for a long time to write a book and I told them well okay I'll write a book but it it isn't going to be the kind of book that you think it is and it's the same thing with these interviews you know what you want and I very rarely give it to you the way you want it <laughs> I'm not a treasure hunter okay but I did write what everybody would think is a treasure book and the only reason I wrote it is because early on in this game I noticed a lot of my friends whom I care a lot about um, and and you know the majority of these friends mm -hmm. and I noticed them starting to chase after fantasies mm -hmm. and fallacies yeah. etc and that kind of bothered me and so I decided I wanted to write a book that would help these people to be a little bit skeptical question everything you look at just because somebody found some scribbling on a quake and aspen doesn't mean it's old yep. in fact when somebody sends me a picture and I see something on a quake and aspen and it's beautiful white bark I'm sorry it's probably not that old yep. um, could it be Jesse James related maybe but unlikely um, but that's why I wrote that book is to try to help people keep their feet planted on the ground stick with what's real ask questions prove all things and so they buy my book and they find out it hasn't got you know a dozen or two maps in the back of it and stories you know Johnny Duguid was up hiking in the mountains and found a hole in the ground and he crawled down into the hole and he found a whole stack of gold bars but he decided he was going to come back later and get them and when he tried to go back he couldn't find it again that's the typical story that you yeah. read in the treasure yeah. books. The blizzard, you forgot the Yeah, oh, the blizzard, yeah, that's <laughs> right. There's got to be a blizzard. You know, and the funny thing is, is I actually have a family story <coughs> that's just like that. I do too. And I know it's a true story, okay? And, and I'll tell it, okay? Because, uh, you know what, if, if you find this, don't forget me. Okay, all I want is one 80 pound bar. That's it. Okay, you can have you can have the rest. But keep your mouth shut for crying out loud. Okay. <coughs> I have an ancestor. It was actually my mother's uncle who was down deer hunting in a particular place. I'll leave out the the should I? It's up to you. Oh, what the heck. There's too many of them to worry about, really. There really is. Believe me, people, there is a lot of these out there. My mother's uncle was deer hunting down in Cove Fort. Cove Fort, Utah. And what road he was on, I don't know. There was no freeway. You have to tell some people that. There was no freeway at the time. This is 30s, 40s maybe. And he went west of Cove Fort hunting deer. 
I don't know where he parked, I don't know where he walked to, I don't know how far away from Co. 40 he was. But he got out there quite a ways from what I understand and didn't have any success in the hunt. He was on his way back to Co. Fort and he noticed a storm coming in but he didn't make it back to where his vehicle was parked in time and he decided that because the storm was upon him that he best just crawl in behind a bush up against a ledge which he did he forced his way back in behind this bush only to find out there was a small cave there you know how convenient and so he gets in there and he gets cozy and he starts grabbing a few little sticks and things and decides to make himself a little fire and wait out the storm. Well, eventually he turns around and he notices these brick looking things up against the wall in the back of this little cave and turns out they're, he estimates, 80 pound gold bars. I don't know how many, don't know how big the stack was, <clears throat> and as the story goes, after the storm passed, he goes outside the cave and he can't decide whether to leave his gun or to take a gold bar. Yeah, it's a no-brainer for me, okay? But this is how the stories go. He decides to hang on to his gun and come back later. He makes dang sure he can find his way back to it. Looks around, checks everything out, and yeah, I can, I can find my way back here. And he could never find his way back. Well, this is a story my mom told me. And my mother, if she told the story, she believed it to be 100% true. Because that's just the way my mother was. Well, it was years later, I was uh, researching some property over at Utah County Recorder's Office. I can't remember the guy's name, but he asked me what I was doing and I told him I was trying to find the landowners for certain properties so I could get permission to go on and look for petroglyphs. And uh, we got talking about petroglyphs. Turns out he knew LeVan Martineau and he told me this story about LeVan Martineau taking him when he was a Cub Scout, Boy Scout, up to a particular place and showed him a panel. And he told the boys this panel tells where there is a gold cache down east of Cold Fort, west, west, west of Cold Fort, and CTC, west of Cold Fort. The other one was north of the volcano. The other story, north this of the what volcano. Levan is telling them. Huh? This is what Levan is telling these. Yes. Now, I went and tried to find that panel. I didn't give it a real good effort. I know where it's supposed to be, but I just never get a chance to go there. Um, I thought that was pretty interesting that from a completely, entirely different source, someone tells me a, a story that ties in with what my mother had told me. Well, many years later, I and a friend of mine were driving down, I uh, can't remember what it's called, the canyon. Chalk Creek? No. The canyon that goes from Cove Fort and up over to Richfield, okay? <laughs> we're driving down the canyon and just as we caught sight of uh, the Cold Fort area, my buddy points out there and he says, Do you know there's a cache out there somewhere with 80 pound bars in it? <laughs> what? <laughs> I said, Where'd you hear that? He said, I heard it from a friend of mine. Um, she's a good friend with the uh, Paiute elders and they told her about it. And I said, really? <laughs> so that's three times. Three times. And so I've, you know, I've had a few people go out, and there's certain things you got to do, you know, but I've given you every piece of information that I had on it. And, you know, it just depends on who you are and how much you put into it. But if they're still out there, which they very well could be, um, go look for it. There's an awful lot of ledges out there. 
north of the volcano and west of Cove Fort. A lot of ledges. Man, finally got a story out of you. <laughs> As far as I'm concerned, it's true. Oh, and I forgot to tell you this part of it. Being the meticulous individual that I can be, even though it was my mother who told me the story, <coughs> I, told, I asked her one day, and this was not too many years before she passed away, um, I asked her, I says, I'm, I'm pretty sure your uncle's not alive anymore. And she says, no, he, he passed away a long time ago, but his son's still alive. And I says, uh, do you have his phone number? And she says, yeah, I got his phone number. And I says, why don't I call him? I'll find out what he knew about it. She said, good idea. So I got him on the phone and uh, I told him that, you know, I would like to tell you a story that my mother told me, and I'd like to know what you know about it. And he says, okay. And so I told him the story that my mother had relayed to me. And I says, now, have you, did your dad ever tell you anything about that? And he goes, no, he didn't. But this makes perfect sense. And I said, why? And he says, you know, when I was just a little kid, my dad used to, take us down to Cove Fort every stinking chance he got. And we would go down there and we'd spend a couple days and we'd go back home and we'd come back down a week or two later and spend a couple days and we would walk up and down those ledges. And one day I asked my dad, Dad, what are we looking for? And he said, Son, in one of these ledges there's a cave. And in that cave is a certain kind of rock. And that's what we're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> now you know what I know. Thank you. So, so back to your book. So what book? You say it's your book. Oh, did I write a book? Yeah, you wrote a book. Well, I, I've actually got a few books. You want to so, hear about so, the books? So that one, yeah. So tell me, that book right there. Okay, Treasures of Utah. So... You're saying it's not like your regular treasure book. It's got information to help you. What, what's got What's got in there that's gonna? You know, why would I want to buy that book? What's gonna? Well, be? because it isn't BS. <laughs> no. Um, I what I've done is I've put information in here regarding tree carvings. Um, I even put, you know, and there, there's been some things that's been learned since. Okay, but information on how to tell the difference between an authentic tree carving and something that's not authentic. And you, there is a lot of phony tree carvings out oh, there. Oh, yeah. Um, there's carvings in here that are fake. Or, well, no, there's no fake ones in here. But there are carvings that are not authentic Spanish carvings. Now, someone carved it, no doubt. But the tree isn't, you know, 40, 50 years old. Mm -hmm. And these are the kind of things that I try to bring to other people's attention. I also put a, a few in here. There are actually some authentic Aspen carvings. Now, I'm, you're going to get people that say, oh, no, Aspens don't live any longer than 150 years. And you can keep on regurgitating that till hell freezes over. But until you actually take a biologist out there who core samples trees for a living and core samples a tree and says, I don't believe it. I'm going to have to core sample it again. And so he does. And he finds out that this particular aspen tree is just shy of 500 years old. Well, he's a believer now. Mm. Okay. And... Uh, there's other things in here. Um, one of the things I am still working on, and it's one of my favorite subjects, is this Lake Kapala. You know, the Lake Kapala was a key point in many of the old Spanish stories. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and regarding the seven cities. Now, I'm not talking about the seven underground cities. I'm talking about the seven cities that were around Lake Kapala. And the slothful researcher 
would say, oh, you mean Utah Lake? No, I don't mean Utah Lake. Um, just because science tells me that a particular lake that just happens to resemble beautifully Lake Kapala on several old Spanish maps is 33 million years old, I'm sorry, that doesn't make it 33 million years old to me, especially when it's on a 14th century map. And it's very clearly the same lake. So somebody's wrong, and I'm not going to say who. I put uh, information in here concerning monuments, how you can tell whether a monument may or may not be authentic, and ways to tell how long it may have been there. Um, some of it's pertaining, I mean, I'll even show you a tree carving that we thought was authentic at one time, until we core sampled it and found out it was carved 12 years ago. Really? <laughs> but it it's basically just giving you a little bit of common sense and telling you how to how to check things i mean there's even a little story in here i don't know how far in depth i went into it but it has to do with a story that was pounded to death back in the early 2000s and the whole story is a bunch of crap and the only reason that I ever investigated it is because one of the ancestors asked me to. And so this story that I always thought was authentic turned out to be a bunch of crap. Mm. It's all made up. Mm. And I can prove it. But, so that's kind of what the book's about is, is, you know, question all things and don't be so quick to believe everything you read in a book. Um, there's a lot of cool things out there to see and a lot of experiences to be had, but you're never going to actually experience them unless you get your butt up, up off that couch and go out and do some exploring. Do some exploring, meet people, hear their stories. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's the treasure, you know. Is, is it really is. That's that's where the whole fun and the excitement yeah. has been for me is Meeting is the people. stories that you can tell about what you did and what happened on that trip. Yeah. You know, it's just a blast uh, watching Steve Warby uh, catch a rattlesnake, knowing he's going to take it back to camp and eat it. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> watching Steve uh, Warby again, <laughs> guy's character. Playing with dynamite, you know, and say, hey, don't touch this right here, and don't touch your forehead, and this and that, and let's just put it back. And <laughs> uh, I got a lot of stories I could tell as far as that goes. Um, but I got another book that um, is almost ready. It's called The Forbidden Histories of the Americas. Yes, it's finally ready. Um, I don't want to send out books anymore. Unfortunately, I've still got about 40 copies of The Treasures of Utah. If you want a copy, send me an email. What's your email? Well, I'll put, mm. I'll put the email in there, but tell me what your email is in there. The email address that I use most is tuscoro at gmail.com. It is T-U-S-C-O-R-O at gmail.com Speaking of Tescoro, tell me about Tes Tescoro because I know you put a lot of information out there on that uh, is it a, it's a blog website? Yeah, blog? it's the blog site. There's a lot of information out there, a lot of interesting information out there. Tell me what what made you decide to create that and thank you for creating that okay. by the way. Okay. Um, I became a member of the Treasures of Utah Forum back when it was Easy Board, and then it became uh, what did it come after that? Um, yeah, I know. Yuku, yeah, Yuku, Yuku. Then it became Treasures of Utah via Yuku, and now it's. I can't remember what they call it now. But anyway, um, I don't know how I did it, but I gained the trust of 
the creator of the board, Randy Bradford, whom I'm extremely grateful to and for, and very pleased to call him friend. <coughs> um, he made me an administrator, and I had a blast with it. It was it was fun, and he told me once that the one of the reasons that he had put me in there as an administrator is because I was a natural diplomat. It, hell, at the time I didn't know what a diplomat was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was there was a lot of little wars going on with a lot of people. Yes, and, and, and I was one of the one of the people at wars, but he was a diplomat. <laughs> yeah, I had to put fires out, and I had to restrain myself and and not say what I really wanted to say, and you know, in some ways, it kind of sucked. Yep, that would have really sucked. That would have really sucked. <laughs> but. You know, and I'm still an administrator in that forum. Uh, I just, I'm sorry, I just don't get in there that much. And one of the main reasons is that everything shifted to social media. And so... Which, which is, in my mind, is crazy. You know, everything has shifted to Facebook and that. But mm -hmm. you go back to the old forums, you know, you've got um, Treasures of Utah, you know, mm -hmm. the ancient... Um, Ancient lost treasures. Yep. You know there is so much information on them boards that you can research, you can search for, you can get that. Facebook man, it gets on there and then it gets pushed clear down to the bottom and it's gone. So See, it's and simply, it blows my mind. And those to me are similar to what treasure books are, and similar to the kind of emails that we get. You might get. You might get a hundred emails, and ninety-five percent of them. I'm sorry, it just doesn't really have anything. Yeah. And but that, those five, you know, yep. there's something really good. Yeah. And the forums are kind of like that. There is some very good information oh, in it. Really I used to I used to have a private section where I taught people how to read the Native American petroglyphs. And I don't want anybody out there thinking that I can walk up to any panel out there and I can tell you what it says. I don't know that anybody's ever going to be able to do that. But I can follow what I have proven to myself, or what I call locator glyphs, and that's how I find some things that nobody knows about. And... <coughs> After being a part of the Treasures of Utah all that time, I, and, and it's starting to fizzle out and go to social media, you know, it kind of gave me an opportunity to go back to what I really love to do, and that's research the Native American petroglyphs and, and the many mysteries of our potential history of this continent that there are. And so I decided to start this blog site. I cannot tell you where the name Tuscoro come from. It's it's a very private thing. Um, and I'll never be able to tell you the story behind that. But it's a unique name. In fact, you type Tuscoro in any search window and you're going to come up with my blog site or something that I have posted in a Mexican treasure forum. Or <laughs> It's, it's kind of easy to follow. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm not sure I like that, but I started doing the blog site, and I started, this was a way for me to talk about and fulfill a need that I have to share things. I love to share what I find. I I like to hear the criticism, not, 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 uh, very poorly constructed criticism because you know I'm one of those that'll stick a middle finger up at you and tell you to hit the road because I don't care what you have to say but if you have something of value to say or you have a perspective hey I, I'd love to hear it because just because I said it doesn't make it so so that's what got me going on the blog site and I've got about four years of articles in there Many of the posts are simply sharing Native American petroglyph sites that I went out and photographed, and, and it's cool, and I want to share the photos. But I've got an awful lot of stories in there. And I don't know how long that site will be there, because quite frankly, I don't know if I'm 
even going to have internet by the end of this month. <laughs> it's, it's that bad right now. When spring rolls around, things will change a little bit. Um, but yeah, winters can be difficult for me. Um, if my plan failed, and this year my plan failed. And so I'm, I'm having a tough time right now. So, hey, I got 40 books. <laughs> <coughs> I, I know there's, there's a ton more uh, interviews that we could do. And, and we more than likely will in the future. In fact, I'd like to see this move in a direction where we're actually going out to the sites and show the evidences. Yep. Um, show what we believe to be real and why we think it's real. And, and um, we, we got a ton of sites. I mean, we, I can see us standing at one site with the camera and saying, okay, right here, somewhere here, there's an opening. And how do we know that? Well, this is why, and this is why, and we pull one of the rocks out of the, you know, slide and show the chisel marks in it. And, you know, common sense says there's an opening here, but as you can see, where is it? You know, I, I can see us out doing that and, and, and filming the conversations around the campfire at night and showing the remnants of villages and ruins that very few people have seen. I'm not talking cliff dwellings. I'm talking in the trees, on the ridges, and finding circles of stones and, and things sometimes that just don't make sense. Yep. I would love to create an organization of professional people. Now, I don't mean people with a degree. However, I'd love to have an archaeologist on board, which I kind of do, but I'd like, I want something a little more solid. I'd love to have a paleontologist. Oh, wait, I do. And I'd love to have a geologist. I have a few that I can consult with, but honestly, I don't think they believe a damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> maybe one of them I just said that to make all three of them feel good <laughs> well it's probably me <laughs> but I would love to put together a professional organization of people uh, to document and prove these things um, the, the biggest battle that we've got is funding. Yep. So we've either got to find somebody who needs tax write-offs because we've got a nonprofit in the working. In fact, you've got a nonprofit yep. for that matter. And somebody who needs tax write-offs or somebody who really doesn't care and has more money than he cares to admit to help fund these projects, or we've got to find one of these locations, preferably one in Mexico, because quite frankly, it takes a lot of burden off our shoulders having to explain things to a government that believes everything belongs to them. Yep. I'd rather deal with Mexico. So, do I have something more to say? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to put together a professional group of people. I feel like we have some of those people already. In fact, um, one particular facet of what we have put together over the years, you'll probably never know about. You might, but I, I'm not gonna tell you who they are yeah. because you know this is my yeah. this is my boots on the ground guy, and he is a no BS kind of individual. And if you ran into him in the street, you'd never know. You'd never know it was him. But he's not afraid to get out there and do what needs to be done. Sometimes he scares me. <laughs> but I'd love to put together a professional group. That's why I bugged you all these years and uh, hounded Sean Davies for years about getting together on various projects and you know, it's 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 the it's the funding, like you said. It's we're all too yeah. busy trying to do a living to do what we really have 
But see, had, had I come up with these ideas 15 years ago, I could have taken care of it myself. Instead, I left myself vulnerable and someone took advantage of it.